Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, September 16, 2021. COVID update. So Delta seems to be, seems to have peaked a little bit and coming down slightly in Oklahoma, which is good news. Uh, we kind of been thinking it would end by the, by the beginning of November, or end of October. So that's what we're seeing some signs of. So that's good news. Unfortunately, we're still having uh, about 2,000 infections a day. We're up to about 30 deaths a day. The hospital systems are taxed. They're surviving, but it's just a difficult business. Um, the ER staffs are just overwhelmed. They're having, I think they're exhausted. The ICU staffs are exhausted. Everyone at a big tertiary care center or medium-sized or small center that takes care of COVID is exhausted and please be nice to these people. Along that same line, uh, I think most healthcare providers are tired, whether in healthcare staff. So, you know, again, I've been really focused on, hey, let's be nice to everyone. Let's be nice to the doctors, the nurses, the front office staff, please continue that. And please remember at our office, it's mandatory and we're having some challenges still with that, unfortunately with people. And so again, as I've said, if you're not gonna be nice, you're not gonna be in our practice. So just keep that in mind, please. So when we're talking about things with COVID, there's been some shifts in the data. It seems like at first it was, the Delta was, a wave of more unvaccinated versus vaccinated and settled out to be about a 60-40 uh, split. It seems now a little bit with the trend of the data that it's kind of maybe even evening out a little bit or shifting. Um, and so what that shows us is that Delta can propagate very e easily in the vaccinated too. Now their overall serious disease reduction it was originally thought to be 99%. It's probably come down a little bit, but we're still, I'm still tracking that and trying to figure out that data because it is very difficult to get any data on the vaccinated getting sick. Remember the CDC is not recording that. They don't want to know the data and it always makes it somewhat difficult, but it does probably seem like we're not going to be at 99% reduction in serious illness. And again, that gets back to immune function. Why not augment your immune function? So take your vitamins, because remember, it's not just the vaccine, it's your immune function. How do you get your immune system to work, whether you were vaccinated or prior infected, by taking appropriate nutritional steps. And if you're not eating really well with lots of vegetables and fruits and that type of stuff, you need to be on a multi, you need to be on vitamin D, you need to be on fish oil, you need to be doing all the things we've talked about so your immune system is revved up to fight off this illness so you won't get sick from it or critically ill from it. And those are the two concepts. The group that has to be most worried is of course always the completely unvaccinated. If you're completely unvaccinated and been uninfected, you are at significant risk of illness from Delta and COVID, it's not made up, it's real. You, that group has made up the vast majority of hospitalizations um, and continues to do so. But again, that's shifted a little. But again, the fact that the, the vaccine isn't 100% effective or in terms of preventing illness, but only provides a 99 to 98 to 97, somewhere in that range, prevention of serious illness is still pretty darn good because you know if you just get COVID you have about a 20% chance of serious illness. So that's a huge reduction in terms of serious illness and then there's a further huge reduction in morbidity or other side effects. So again the vaccine is still uh, very important. Now on that subject I'm not a paid uh, speaker by any entity in terms of big pharma so some people have have commented, oh, I must be making money by encouraging the vaccine. We don't give the vaccine. No one charges for the vaccine anywhere in the United States. Now, do doctors, scientists, some of them get paid for promoting the vaccine? Absolutely, but we're never going to know predominantly who they are because they're going to keep it secret so they don't look like jerks. Um, but there's none of that here. There's no big pharma money anywhere. Or I I don't know what that example would be. But anyway, there's just not. We're, I'm just doing this for free. So anyway, Enough of that. So Kim, you have some questions, and Kim is my trusty cohort here, who's kind of tired because this is my third try tonight. <laughs> On the first try, you talked about the two doctors that resigned. Did you want to talk Oh, about yeah, that? thank you. So I want to remind everyone about the uselessness of the booster, okay? There is no scientific evidence the booster works. There is potentially a use for it in the immunocompromised. There is no definitive data showing it helps in that group either. 
but the two heads of the booster program at the FDA resigned in protest over giving boosters to healthy vaccinated people, okay? Because there's no evidence it works. Now that begs the question, should people who've been infected with antibodies get the booster? Well, or get a, not a booster, but get the vaccine. The answer to that remains up in the air. No one will address it in the United States because we will pretend we don't have natural immunity. We know that if you give someone who's been infected the vaccine, their immune measures max out, but when you look at it in clinical trials so far, there's not been a documented improvement in clinical outcome by vaccinating the prior infected. It appears that if you just look at the prior infected data with Delta out of Israel, there's a 600 to 700% reduction in infection in prior infected versus vaccinated, who are both obviously less than, uh, than unvaccinated. But the big thing is if you've been infected, there's your long-term immunity to COVID is probably there I mean, there's been plenty of data about that, but again, every time I, I, we bring, I bring this up, occasionally I get sniped at by you know, doctors who think I'm an ass. But you know, hey, I'm sorry, it's the data. And so again, I just can't really strongly advocate any boostering for people who've been, I, well, I don't think anyone should get a booster who's been vaccinated um, unless they're immunocompromised. And then two, I don't really feel like people who have a documented PCR infection and preferentially did at some point have some antibodies really needs the vaccine. But that's my opinion. It's a personal opinion from reading the data. Go ahead, Kim. Okay. Um, is Plaquenil a biologic? Plaquenil is not a biologic. It's a disease modifying drug. So it affects the inflammatory cascades and keeps them down. Um, so there's no issue if you've gotten vaccinated or in, on Plaquenil. <laughs> Practically no one got infected on, on Plaquenil though because uh, Plaquenil is super protective. I mean, we did not stop using Plaquenil because it didn't work. We stopped using Plaquenil because the data on Ivermectin was equal to or slightly better and it had less side effects. Plaquenil does not affect your heart, but it does give you heartburn and some stomach upset, ivermectin does not. So it, it's a more tolerated um, medication. Okay, what's the name of the antibody test? The antibody test name is SARS-2 COVID quantitative antibody test. It's a specific antibody that is made, a series of antibodies that are made to the spike protein and it was the precise measurement for the Janssen, or j, &J sorry, um, j and J vaccine, Moderna, and Pfizer. So that's why we check it, so we can see if you had appropriate antibody response. But again, the antibodies that we're checking for that is just for the very tip of the spike protein. So again, if you get infected, and this is the spike protein, you made antibodies to the whole thing in the lower part of the spike protein. If you got the vaccine, you just made it to this tip area. Okay, so if, you th if you're intelligent, you might think that having antibodies to the tip and the whole way around the tip perhaps might be effective in preventing recurrent infection, which I do and I think the Israeli data shows. So with that SARS-2 antibody test, um, how do you interpret the levels of it for immunity? Well, I think if you're positive, you're immune. I mean, we might think you're more immune if you're higher, but you're immune. And the, the whole thing with measures is that it's your clinical response, meaning do you fight off the infection? And I think we would say that the numbers don't matter. We know that from prior vaccine studies that titers didn't matter. So I think ultimately, if you have an antibody response, it shows your B cells work and your T cells work, which is really what this is about. It's not about your antibody levels. Antibody levels can fade over time, but you still have immunity because we can't constantly be rubbing our immune system like that. It has to have time and space to not be completely rubbed up. Otherwise things go bad. Um, if you have antibodies from either and, uh, having the disease or getting 
the vaccine, can that cause a negative test if you're actually positive? No. If you have a positive PCR test, it is because you have replicating viral particles, assuming you have an accurate test. But can you test negative if you, if you, could you have COVID and test negative because you have antibodies? No, if, if you test negative when you have COVID, it's because your test was bad, not because of the antibodies. So again, it breaks down to roughly about a third or 40% of people are gonna be immune from the vaccine, about, 30% or so are going to be asymptomatic carriers and they would be test positive um, and probably a third would be symptomatic and they would test positive with, within that 30% roughly. Um, one to two to three now might get more seriously ill. So again, we get a pretty massive reduction in serious illness, uh, but it's not quite as robust as we were hoping, but you know, mutations happen. Then Not that we were ever thinking this one would happen. How do variants develop? And is there any truth to it being because of vaccines since the virus has to mutate to survive? So variants develop by having a pool of people, since we're talking about people, who can get infected with the virus. And as it replicates, it during the replication process, the viral genomic DNA changes or mixes up, and so you get a different look of the same virus. And that we originally were thinking with when we had just the first few or probably thousands of mutations, but they're all within the alpha beta group, um, were covered very, very well by the vaccine. So you had really good immunity, so there wasn't much replication. And it, you had very, very good coverage, and even better, it looks like, from having the infection. So what happened though with the Delta is uh, even though there has been a lot of people infected and a lot of people vaccinated, there was enough of a pool of people who could get COVID and have it replicate that there eventually there occurred a mutation that was different enough that it broke away from that spike protein neutralizing antibody series. And so it then could infect a greater portion of them. Likewise, it would continue to infect the unvaccinated. Well, as it's turning out, the pool of vaccinated people is much greater than we originally thought we're gonna get infected with the Delta. So that, is, that doesn't mean they're, getting, they're all getting that sick. It just means that they have, they're a reservoir of viral replication, just like the unvaccinated. So, Ultimately, it calls into question what's gonna be the best way to beat this. It's not gonna be continual vaccinations. It is going to be two things. It is everyone either needs to get infected or everyone needs to get vaccinated, period. That is going to limit the disease spread. And yes, there's going to be a pool of reinfections or infections in the vaccinated group, but they will still be limited in less, so that still helps. The ultimate fix for this is going to be coming up with an outpatient treatment strategy. And so when we look at Pfizer developing their outpatient treatment strategy, which is basically a analog of ivermectin, it tells you where Big Pharma is going, but I'm also going to tell you it isn't going to be 30 bucks for a treatment cycle, it's gonna be $1,000. And that's how Big Pharma makes money, because all of a sudden it will be fine to take an ivermectin analog, and that's what the future holds. Okay, so uh, take care, stay positive, and I think we're gonna get through this and things will be normal soon, but, or reasonably normal. <laughs> Good night.